Last time we went over an example that included master pages, so let's take a minute to review that and then go on to the next step of the process. The idea here is that there are components in ASP.NET that allow you to do everything easier. And one of the things that we're looking at with master pages is the ability to have sort of a shell of a web page that gets filled in with specific details from page to page. So what we've done in our little website example is we've created a uh, website for retro toys and we want a consistent layout from page to page and we don't want to have to change a whole bunch of pages if something in the common area changes. So for example, we've created a master page. And in the master page is the common code, the stuff that appears on every page. We then can clone that master page for every item, for every page within the site and only change the, 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 the code that's distinct to that particular page. We have our master page, which contains a common code, stuff that's going to appear on every single page. Now in our particular case, we only have HTML code, all right? But you could also have code in your code behind, if you had a button on the page that did a search, for example. Um, you could put that within the master page and have all searches work the same way. All right, so um, don't think that just because we only did HTML means that you only can do HTML. You can put anything in an ASP.NET page in a master page because there is a master ASPX page, sort of, and a master CS page. So we could have C-sharp code. If you notice in here, it looks just like an HTML document, or rather an ASPX document, with the exception that, by default, there are two content placeholders. We don't put anything in those content placeholders in the master page. These are the places where we're going to have stuff that appears on each individual page. So this is the stuff that's distinct to a particular page, goes in the content placeholder. The stuff outside of it is the stuff that uh, appears uh, in the common section of the site. So in 
in the site that in the stuff that appears on every page. So I'm going to set the home page as a default page. Run this, <clears throat> and you notice that we'll see some code from the master page, some code from default.aspx. This stuff is all from the master page, as is this stuff. This image of the robot is from the default ASPX page. So if we look at the default ASPX page, all we see is instead of content placeholders, we see content tags. And those use the IDs to associate what content tag gets put where in the master page. So what gets put in this content placeholder? Well, the ID is content placeholder 1. So the stuff in the content tag that has the content placeholder ID of content placeholder 1 gets put in there. We have a second page. And again, all we have on that second page is what's distinct to that second page. The stuff that is on the master page just stays there. All right? So we duplicate the stuff that's on the master page, and we just fill in sort of the middle area um, with our content. The good news, of course, is if we want to change something, Appearance-wise, we change it in the CSS. If we want to change something in the common content, we change it in the master page. If we want to change something specific to the page, we change the page itself. So if I want more information in the footer, for example, that's something in the com common code, and I'll go to the master page to do that. So maybe I want a capital A. Thank you for visiting. I don't know. We'll just put some new code in there so that we can see it. Now when we run it, every page that is cloned from the master page will get that new content. So default, default page gets it, and the 1960s page gets it. Questions about this? Pretty straightforward. Do it once or twice and you should have it down. All right. Uh, usually the things that people mess up and the things that people get wrong are that they don't follow the clean separation of they might put something in the master page within the content placeholder tag. Remember, on the master page you don't put anything within the content placeholder tag. And on the individual page, they put stuff outside of the content tag. All right. So on the master page, you don't put anything inside the content placeholders. On each individual page, you only put stuff within the content tag. So content placeholder is empty on the master page. You only put stuff in the content, content tag on the individual page. Now, we can nest master pages. Uh, for example, let's say we had a portion of the site where you could actually purchase stuff. Let's say that we had two, uh, two pages to purchase apparel and to purchase um, toys. All right? And let's say those sections had its own content in it, had something in common that the other page didn't. All right. Sort of like if we go to LC's website, you'll notice that certain things, like this thing at the top and the footer on the bottom, is the same on every single page. But then when you get into a section of the website,
the admissions and enrollment section, this is there, this is there, but there's also a new section of common content, not for every page on the site, but every page within the section. So within admissions and enrollment, if we look around, this is common code. Okay, so what we can do is we can nest the master pages. In this case, if they used ASPX for this, they would have a master page that would contain the header and the footer, and then they might have a master page for this section that was based off of the main master page and also added to it a content placeholder for, or, or uh, a navigation on the side and a content placeholder for uh, the other stuff. All right, so we're going to do that. We're going to assume that there is an extra navigation on our purchase pages. So purchase toys, purchase apparel, uh, we're going to have uh, a separate section for that. Uh, so I'm going to make a shop page. So all those, I'm going to make a shop page, and from that shop page you can purchase apparel or purchase uh, uh, toys. All right? So... I'm going to go and I'm going to create a new master page. And I'm going to base it based on a master page. And I'll call it shop. It'll ask me what master page I want to base this master page off of. And guess what? It's more or less like a regular ASPX page, except it becomes a master page. So I can put in my content placeholder another navigation. So now I have a master page that looks like this. All right. It has everything from the master page plus everything that I put on this page. And then I can put on this page my shop master. I can put a content placeholder of its own. Content placeholder three, for example. Okay? And so if I look at this, I have everything from the main master, the new stuff for this master, and then I have a content placeholder that I can put new stuff for stuff that gets cloned off of this master page. All right, so let's make a shop toys page. Or let's make a shopping page. I'm going to put 
little link to it. And I want that to appear on every page, so I'll put it on the master page. Then I'll make a new page for the shopping page, and I'll select a master page, but I'll clone the shop master. And I get my content placeholder here, and I can put in something like a paragraph or let's put an H1 shopping home this is shopping home page and I'd have other stuff like maybe I'd talk about our what payments we accept uh, what our return policy is that sort of stuff all right and then I could also clone a new web form and do our shop toys page. That clones from the shop master. And in there I can put shop for toys. And I can have all the information about shopping for toys. The idea, the idea of this is shot for apparel twice. It's weird it's giving me that air. Actually now it doesn't show me that air. I have a feeling uh, because I didn't save the master page, I made changes to it without saving it, that it was griping about that. Uh, my shopping home uh, page though has two shot for apparel, so we'll make one shot for toys. I, say, I thought I did everything right. It must have been that it wasn't saved yet. So since it wasn't saved, this guy didn't know anything about a placeholder of three, and therefore it, it gave me an, an error. Okay, so all my shopping pages have everything that's in the master file plus everything that is in the second master file, the nested master file. And everything that's in here has everything that's in the master file. So if I want to change every page, I put it in the master file. If I want to change every page in the shopping section, I put it in the shopping section's master file. If I want to change the specific page, I then change the specific page. So you can nest master file things. Uh, as many levels as you want. You don't have to nest though, right? For many sites, particularly smaller sites, one level of master page is probably enough. All right? Uh, for, I did want to describe that though in case you had a larger project where you had sections of page that had a certain set of content in common 
with everything else. And again, a good example of that ZLC one, where overall there's a structure to the site. Certain sections within the site have another set of shared content in addition to the shared content between every page on the site. Okay, questions about this. Let's move on to navigation. Now, navigation is something that's so important in web development, right? Um, so it only makes sense that there's a tool that will allow you to do that fairly easily. So we're going to go over a couple examples of navigation and how we can do it. And we can view um, the tools that are available within the .NET framework to make our life a little easier about that. Let's go in the main master file because we're going to start out making changes to this right here. Okay? So I'm going to remove these links to start out. So I'm going to remove all of them. I am then going to go and I'm going to put in my nav section a I have two choices these two things do about the same thing um, a menu and a tree view I'm going to start out by putting a menu in my nav section and there it is okay we look at it there is a menu within my nav section. Now, how do I add elements to the menu? Well, I can click on this guy and I can say edit menu items. One thing that we might do later on, and that you have the ability to do, is choose a data source. All right? In other words, a listing of all the pages that you have might come from the database. Let me give you a for instance for that. Let's say you have a database that has products in it. And there's a table in the database that has a list of categories. There may very well be one page per category. All right? And our navigation might be simply pulling up the categories and creating a page for each of them. All right? In that case, we wouldn't write on our own a navigation like we're going to do right now. We would pull the data from the category table, format it in the right ways, and bind this control to the database results. That way, if we added a new category in the database table, it would automatically add the new page to the navigation. Okay? So, that's more going forward. We're not going to do that right today. If that confused you, forget I said anything about it. All right? And just pay attention to what I'm doing now. Because what we're going to do is we're going to manually go in and edit the menu items. So, I'm going to go in and I'm going to add... And the first one is home. And the navigate URL is default.aspx. I can hit add again. In fact, I'm going to hit add for how many pages do we have? 50, we have the home page, then we have 50, 60, 70, 80s, 90s, 2000s, 2010s, shop, shop toys, shop apparel. I think that's 10 pages. So I'm going to go and add 10 of these. I'm going to go and change each one of them. The text for this is going to be 1950s. And the link is 1950s.aspx. 
Actually, I did. I did the wrong one, so I'm going to use the arrows to put it in the right place. This one, the text should say 1960s, and the navigate URL should be 1960s.aspx. Nineteen seventies and nineteen seventies ASPX. Nineteen eighties. I got too excited about this one and added too many decades. I should only do a couple decades. Here's all my pages. notice there is our navigation here. If we run it, home, 1960s, shop toys, or shop, shop toys, shop apparel, and so on. So the navigation doesn't look much different than it did originally. But, by setting the properties, we can make it do different things if we want to. For one thing, I can make, I can change the orientation of the navigation from vertical to horizontal. Now, it doesn't look like it made any change here, but that's because we haven't created a sort of a, any sub-navigation uh, string. All right. We can set the style for it. We can do a lot of stuff for it. Now, where this really comes in good is we can do some mouse over action for free. So really, toys and apparel sort of are a subcategory between um, of, of, of shop, right? So I could go in here and I can click the demo button. I'm sorry. I can make it underneath shop. So now notice that it indented it a little bit, and those are considered a submenu underneath shop. All right. So now when I run it, notice what I get. I don't see all the links, but I see a little arrow next to shop. Shop toys, shop apparels. I take my mouse off, it disappears. You can actually configure how long it stays before it disappears. Because it actually, if you notice, there's just a little teensy pause there. Maybe a half second. 
I could also clean this up and maybe I could create a uh, retro toys and modern toys section of this site. So let's go in here and I'm going to edit the items and I'm going to add a root item for retro toys. And if I don't actually put in a URL, it's just sort of a section heading in the menu. It's not really a web page. So I could create one for retro toys, and I can create one for modern toys. And then I could arrange it so that maybe 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s are in retro toys, 90s, 2000s, 2010s are under modern toys. So I can use this arrow to push this up, use this to move over, I didn't want to do that, use this to move over the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, use this to push modern toys up, use this to push over 90s, 2000s, and 2010s. And now, it really makes the navigation cleaner, right? Because we were in danger of like having a whole bunch of stuff, a whole long line in that navigation. Or here, we categorize things a little bit. So now if I go and view this, we get that. Now notice how this is overlapping that, so we can't see it. We'll address that in a couple minutes here. All right. I can also change a lot about the orientation of it simply by saying that I want this menu to have a horizontal orientation rather than a vertical orientation. that will do is, as we go and mouse over, it appears underneath. Alright, so you can decide how you want the menu actually to work. You can also show, to sh you can also choose how many levels you want to show initially. So for example, I can choose two layers. Right now it's set to one layer. If I choose two layers, then when I run this, that's how it shows, kind of like it did before, right? So we can pick how, we can pick some specifics about how we want the menu to act in the properties of this to get the exact look. Now again, this is one of those things that like if you take some of my other web development classes, you learn how to write JavaScript like this. This is a terribly difficult JavaScript to write, but it gives you the ability to configure it based on parameters and therefore you can go in and you can uh, make it work exactly the way you want to without having to do any coding. Remember, when you're using a framework, usually you're caught in, in, in you have three broad options. One is you use the framework exactly how it is. All right? Um, and you can tweak parameters to customize it somewhat. Two is you can write your own code to work with the framework to get it to do exactly what you want. Three is you can throw parts of the framework out the window and code it all yourself. All of them are valid options in a given situation. If you have a very specific way that you want your navigation to work and the framework doesn't easily deliver that, write it yourself. Right? You don't have to use the framework. However, 
know what you're gaining and what you're losing. You're gaining the fact that you can write it, you can get it to do exactly what you want. You're losing the fact that there's going to be some consistency and there these controls that Microsoft created have been very well tested. So chances are your code's not going to be as well tested as their code was. Okay? So we're going to leave it like that. I'm going to set this to vertical. And we're going to view the problem that we had again, namely, when we run this, we get some overlapping. How do you think we want to handle this, this overlapping? Padding, we could do padding, we could do margins. We could make sure the background of this guy is white. So instead of overlapping where we see both, is over, uh, when it overlaps, it will completely hide the thing behind it. So that's the approach, approach that I'm going to take. In order to do that, I'm going to look at the code that got generated. Remember, your CSS questions are best addressed if you look at the code that gets generated. So I'm going to view source and see what HTML actually got created. And if we look, we will see that each element has a class pop out and level. This has a class of level two. The default, the home page, and the other pages have a class of level one. So everything in here has a class of level 1 and level 2. The problem is, is when the level 2s appear, there's no background color associated with level 2s, and therefore is considered to be transparent, and you can't see, uh, you can't see it completely because it overlaps the text that's behind it. So I'm going to go in here, and I'm going to say my CSS, Wherever that is, here we go. I'm going to say things with a class of level two has a background of white. And now notice how when it overlaps, it completely blocks that. All right, we don't have a 1950s page, so it gives us that. Okay? Remember, I, I actually, someone actually approached me to write a chapter in a textbook about ASP.NET a few years ago. And they didn't want me to talk about HTML in it. It was like, this book is for people who do ASP.NET, not HTML. And I stuck to my guns and I said, you know what? You have to know the HTML that gets created to understand how to style things properly and to be able to do a good job creating CSS. Otherwise, you're going to make a mess of it. They disagreed, so I didn't use my chapter. But I got paid anyhow, so I don't really care. All right? Now, any questions up to this point? As a nice advantage that we can configure this and we get this really exactly the way that we want to and, and, and so on. And with a little bit of custom CSS, we can get it um, the way that we want to. And those of you that said that we could address this with padding and so on, you're not wrong. We could do that as well. All right? I just chose this way of doing it. Was the pop-out level class, was that for the on-hover? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I believe the pop-out the pop out thing added the on-hover functionality to it. Probably did it all with CSS to say on-hover, 
make everything underneath this guy, make every child that had a class of, L, of level two visible. I think, by the way, that there's not much difference between the, the horizontal and vertical because I made uh, the, the thing in line block for these guys. That's why I don't think there's a difference. If I get rid of that style rule, I think we'll see a difference. If I get rid of this. So now, notice it looks like that, the menu. I was wondering why vertical and horizontal did not look any different, or did not look that much different. Then I remembered, ah, I have that style rule in there to do that. Okay. All right. The other kind of navigation that you can have is called a tree view. Now, a tree view is similar to what you get, or what you used to get anyhow, in Windows Explorer. All right? Whereas you have sort of a tree of navigation items that you can expand or contract and if you expand it, it stays expanded. If you contract it, it stays contracted. The menu has this mouse over thing. Whereas you mouse over, you mouse out, it shows and disappears. With the tree view, if you click on it, it will show the submenu, and the submenu shows no matter what you do until you click on the menu item again. So let's do the let's do a tree menu just to be different. Let's do a tree menu on the shop master page for this little little bitty menu. All right, so I'm going to go and put a tree view here. And I'm going to edit the nodes. This is real similar to what I did they're called nodes instead of items, but guess what? They work exactly the same. I'll click on add. I will say this is the shop home. And the navigate URL is shop.aspx. I'll add a child underneath it for shop toys. Another one for shop apparel. I made a mistake. I put shop apparel underneath shop toys. It should be underneath shop home. So I can go and promote it. So I can bump it up a level. This bumps it down a level, this bumps it up a level. So now when I run this, if I go to one of the shop pages, I can expand or contract that menu. And again, if you have more menu items, you can add, you can, so you can, you can expand or contract them. Um, under <coughs> When you were doing in the, uh, when you were editing the nodes for the shop apparel, you put that the uh, URL was just shop space apparel. You didn't do shop apparel dot aspx. So was that gonna? Yeah, that would mess it up. <laughs> you make it shows like because you put shop space apparel. I was like, uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> let's let's look and make sure. So for shop, I have shop aspx for shop toys. Shop toys for shop apparel. Yeah, that should be shop. Apparel.aspx. So these are nice techniques that you can use. Uh, really, you do this one or two times, and I think you have it. It's, it's not really uh, complicated. Um, the idea is, is that you, with the master pages, you could create common content. 
Now we're not so worried about getting the carbon content right, because if we have to go back and change it, there's only one place to change it. And that's really our goal, right? Our goal is to avoid any duplication of effort. So um, if something happens, it's really clear what change we have to make and where we have to make that change. Questions? I like to talk about, I don't know if we'll be able to get this in completely today, but I'd like to start talking about it. XML. All right. What is XML? Does anyone know? Is it sort of like a markup language? Yeah. XML, again, XML and HTML, their names sound similar. They both end in ML. And ML stands for markup language. So they're both markup languages. Now, HTML is a markup language for web pages, for hypertext. XML is more of a generic X, uh, uh, markup language, which means that we can make our own sort of language, or other organizations can make their own language for a variety of purposes. So it's a more general purpose thing. All right? HTML is sort of a specific version of, X, of XML specific to making web pages. We've already seen an example of an XML file, and that is the web config file. If we look at the web config file, notice that there's tags. All right? There's a declaration at the top that talks about what version of XML is used. There's comments, and then there's tags. All right? There's a configuration tag. That means something specific in this particular XML file. So Microsoft defined a format that says, here's the tags that we're going to use for a web config file. Just like in HTML, they define, here's the tags we're going to use for an HTML file. So the configuration file, uh, or tag rather, means something. The system.web tag means something. The HTTP runtime means something. These are all things that Microsoft defined when they were creating this XML format. Okay? So, XML is a little stricter than HTML. In HTML, I kind of always put ending tags in, but actually there are some ending tags that you don't need. Right? You don't need to put an end paragraph tag, for example. You could, you could leave that out. You don't need an end image tag. You could actually get by without some ending tags. XML is stricter. You always have to have an ending tag. All right? It's also stricter as far as the case of the tags. With HTML, you can put in upper or lower case. With XML, uh, the tags are defined to be lower case. Actually, the tag, yeah, the tags are typically defined to be lower case. But other than that, they're very similar. Have to be nested properly, right? These are nested. You can only use the kind of tags that are approved. So if I try to create a made-up tag, surprise it doesn't give me a little squiggly line. Let's try putting it in here. Yeah, there it puts a squiggly line in. Hey, you can't, there's no such thing as a made-up tag. So there are certain tags that are defined as, as acceptable. All right. So how are we going to use this here? We're going to use what's called a sitemap. Okay? We're going to create a sitemap XML file. This is a little confusing, but let's go and do it. So I'm going to go File, New, File. 
and I'm going to pick from here. a site map. And I click add. Now, site maps only have one tag that's allowable. That makes things easy, right? Actually, two tags. There's a site map tag, which is called the root node. What do I mean by root node? If I were to say site map is the root node of this XML file, what does that mean? What do you notice about all the other tags? They're missing. They're inside it, right. So when I refer to something as the root node, that means that every other tag is inside it. So, that's another rule of XML, that there, there's only one root node. There's only one, there, there is there's some tag that everything else is inside of. Okay? So, in the case of a sitemap XML file, that's a sitemap. Inside of the sitemap is a series of sitemap nodes. And these are much like the nodes that we defined when we defined the tree and the menu control. So for example, I can put default.aspx because that is my home page. All right. There can only be one of these sitemap nodes inside the sitemap. But then I can have things like this. I could have nineteen. fifties.aspx and give a title for it. So we can put a URL and a description underneath this. So we have fifties, sixties, seventies, eighties, nineties, twenty ten, and shop. And when I define it this way, I'm one off. There we go. When I define it this way, I'm saying all of these are on, a, on an even level. And then I come to shop. And I can put the sub-pages of shop inside of that sitemap node, right? So everything is underneath the default, the home page, and then the shop pages are underneath the shop node. This is shorthand for a starting and ending tag all rolled into one. So I can just go in and... Put that in there. Put 
Shop toys. And shop apparel. All right. Okay. This basically is a structure of our site. We have our home page. Underneath the home page are all those pages, including a shop section. Underneath the shop section are two other pages. So the nesting shows the nesting shows the um, the nesting shows the uh, what am I going to say here? Nesting shows the structure of the site. Okay, fine and good. What can we do with that? What we can do is we can put what are called breadcrumbs on our page. They don't call them breadcrumbs in the .NET framework. They call the sitemap path. But it will show you how you got to that page, where the page fits in the structure. And I can do that on the master page. So I'm going to go to my master page. And I can put anywhere, really, wherever it makes sense, I can put a sitemap path. All right. Now when I go run this, get an error. All right. Why do I get an error? Same reason I get an error when I um, create a validation, put a validator on a page. The defaults are set up goofy for the sitemap path. So I have to make a change to my web config to use it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to download what you need to put in your sitemap, I'm sorry, in your web config file to make your sitemap work the way that you want it to. I don't want to get into my cam campus. I want to get into Canvas. All right, I'm going to do it the time-honored way. I'm going to copy this error and Google it.
angry that it put me to Bing instead of Google. And I'm going to go to Google instead. You can simply copy what I'm doing here. I think it, I don't know, I have the provider so. Notice it shows us as we go to page to page. Oh, I picked a bad page there. Let's go to 1960s. It shows that I went from home to 1960s. If I go to shop toys, home, shop, shop toys. Okay. So that's 
you have to put that chunk of code in your system web portion of your web config file. And you can just grab it from mine if you're getting that error. Now the other thing we can do, that this is foreshadowing of something we can do um, um, later on, is I can make a menu based on the site map or a tree view based on the site map. That saves me having to manually add in all those items like I was doing today. So what I can do is, and I'll just do this for laughs on the home page. I can go and put in a menu here. Choose data source, new data source, site map, OK. And now when I view it, I get a menu down here that's based on the site map. All right. So that saves me having to do that. Uh, that's kind of cool. But what's important about that is the notion of binding. When I created this menu, I didn't say that these are the values that appear in the menu. I didn't go into um, enter data items and go in and manually enter them in. I said the data comes from a data source. And then I linked that control to that data source. And so that data source will retrieve the data and it will automatically get populated with the values from that data source. We're going to do that all over the place when we get into database interactivity. All right? We'll create a data, we'll create a visual control, a grid maybe. All right? We'll then write a SQL statement to retrieve certain data. And then we'll bind those two together, which means that when the data set gets populated, automatically the visual display gets the data from that data set. So that's sort of something to look forward to that we're going to do, is bind data to visual controls. And this is a first example of that. You do the exact same thing with the tree view, by the way. All right, next week, probably spend a few minutes wrapping this up, seeing if there's any questions, seeing if I missed anything, and then we'll jump into database stuff. All right, we'll see you over in land.